So today we are discussing on the uh, fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, text 11. This is 411. Ke thamam prapadyante tam sathaiva bhajamyaham amavartman vartante anushyaha partha sarvashaha. So ye thamam prapadyante. Krishna says, as all people surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. And importantly, Mama Vartamanu Vartante, Manushyaha Partha Sarvashaha, Mama Vartamanu Vartante. All people are on my path. Sometimes this is translated as Mama Vartama Anu Vartante, that all paths lead to me. So here we'll be discussing what this means, especially in terms of why there are different paths and how you can look at the PowerPoint. You will see various points over there, why there are different paths, why, uh, how we can evaluate different paths and how we can commit to one path while also appreciating other paths. So in this case, broad, uh, broadly speaking, one metaphor we'll be using, the metaphor of climbing up a mountain. Now, when we climb up a mountain, at that time, there are two, dis there is the bottom of the mountain and there is the top of the mountain. So the bottom of the mountain is material consciousness. The top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness. And each one of us needs to move on that journey from the bottom to the top. Now for this journey to take place, what all is required? Firstly, we need a path to go up the mountain. So this is a journey which every human heart ultimately longs for, even if that heart doesn't know that it's longing for it. How is that? Because we are all longing for lasting life and lasting love. And lasting life and lasting love are not to be had at the material level of reality. They can be had only at the spiritual level. So those, our efforts might be directed in various directions. When we watch say romantic movies, when we read novels, when we try to form romantic relationships, when we, we, whenever we are actually looking for something lasting, some lasting connection, we are expressing often in a misdirected way, that aspiration to climb up to the top of the mountain because it is the spiritual level of reality that is eternal. At the material level, things are temporary. So that was one of the fundamental teachings of the Gita. Nasato vidyate bhavo nabhavo vidyate sataha ubayo rapitrishton tastvanayo sattva darshibhi. In 2.16, Krishna says that of the temporary, there is no, of, there's no endurance the material keeps changing constantly. And of the eternal, there is no cessation. So this is the journey that we all want to take. Now on this journey, or for this journey, the path that is there, different people have different visions of that path. So broadly, this vision can be talked about in three, three ways. That exclusivism, pluralism, and inclusivism. So if you look at the diagram, you'll see that exclusivism refers to the idea that there is only one path. This, this path is the only way to the mountain. So we could say that when we are trying to climb up a mountain, there is a path and there is a purpose. So the path refers to which particular road we are taking. Purpose refers to where we want to go, that is the top of the mountain. So in exclusivism, people are more attached to the path than to the purpose. And they think this is the only path. Now, exclusivism strikes us as unreasonable as na and narrow-minded. Why? Because in exclusivism, the basic point comes up that if God is infinite, then why should the ways to him be finite? And not only finite, why only one? If God is God, God's love is unlimited, 
then why would he limit access to him and the expression of his love to only one path? So there are religions in the world and there are traditions in the world which are exclusivist. So the word exclusivist so refers to something like say if a particular channel, say ESPN has exclusive coverage of a sports event, say a cricket world cup, then, they, then that means it's only available here, nowhere else. So like that, some people say that God is accessible only in their path and no other path. So exclusivism seems narrow-minded to us. Now, if we go to the other, other extreme, we can have pluralism. Pluralism holds that all paths are right. Now, when this happens, when we say that all paths are right, there is a problem with that, a serious problem, in fact. And that is that two ways we could look at it. First of all, if, if you are at the bottom of a mountain, logically speaking, there could be paths which go around and around the mountain. There could be paths which go down into a valley. There are paths which go away from the mountain. And there could be paths which go up the mountain. So logically speaking, all paths don't go up the mountain. So pluralism so seems very broad-minded, but actually it's empty-minded. So empty-minded means you know, it makes open-mindedness into a fetish. It raises open-mindedness to such an absolute value that we want to be open-minded, but not so open-minded that our brains fall out and there's nothing left inside. So logically speaking also, another way of looking at pluralism is that if we consider that, say, if all paths are right, that is, the, that is the statement. Then one path is that, among all paths, one path is that only my path is right. So if all paths are right, then one of those paths, which says that only my path is right, should also be right. So if A is all paths are right, then B, only my path is right, should also be right. So if A is right, then B should be right. But if B is right, then A can't be right. If only my path is right, then all paths can't be right. So pluralism leads us to a, a logical, leads to a logical quicksand in which we get suckered. And there is no easy way ahead. So, so exclusivism and pluralism, we could say are both problematic. People who are exclusivist often instead of trying to go up the mountain, they keep going round and round the mountain and pulling down people from other paths saying that their path is wrong. Whereas pluralists go all over the place and think that they are going up the mountain and they're actually not going up the mountain. So beyond this, there is inclusivism. Inclusivism means there is one purpose which includes many paths. And that one purpose that includes many paths means that what is the one purpose? That one purpose is to get to the top of the mountain. Get to the top of the mountain. And now there can be many paths up the mountain. Somebody can go from the left, the right, the front, the back. Somebody can go from a side which is very vertically steep, but it gets you up faster, but it's dangerous. Somebody can go from a slowly inclined, slowly rising side where the ascent is slower but it is smoother so like that there can be different parts of the mountain but the key is <coughs> that we should be rising up the mountain if you're not rising up the mountain then it's not a valid path So for each one of us, <clears throat> now let's, these three paths, how do they relate to this Gita verse and how does it relate 
to what is being taught in the Gita till now. This is the first the conceptual understanding of what the Gita is teaching. And then let's look at this concept. So basically the Gita begins with Arjuna's question about how, uh, what should I do? And Krishna answers to understand what you should do. You should know who you are. And he talks about the difference between the body and the soul. And then he talks about how that spiritual identity needs to be expressed through our practical activity in this world. So we talk about various aspects in that direction. And uh, <clears throat> in the previous session, we talked about how Krishna and God himself descends to this world to, min to give revelation and to maintain social order in the world. So now we maintain social order in the world. So when, even when God comes and descends, not everybody surrenders to him. Not everybody harmonizes with him. So different people have different ideas and they follow different things. So Krishna says the principle here is of reciprocity. As people surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. So that principle of reciprocity. Now what does it mean actually? So God is not just a principle. He is a person. And as a person, what it means is that he is, he is, he is a love. He, he he seeks love and he offers love. And loving relationships are based on reciprocation. So Krishna, to the extent we approach him, to the extent he reveals himself. And thus, if somebody starts climbing up the mountain, the vision of the peak becomes clearer and clear, clearer. So so. Krishna reveals himself more and more as we take efforts to go closer and closer to him. And <clears throat> now what does this mean that the second half, the first half is there's a principle of reciprocity. It's like when we want to relate with someone, we, we share our hearts with them and they share their hearts with us. We commit to them, they commit to us. It's a reciprocity. Now Krishna is always committed to us in the sense that is always present in our hearts. He is always our well wisher. At the same time, he doesn't impose himself on us. So he doesn't reveal himself to us more than what we want to see him. So that's the first principle of reciprocity. Now this reciprocity it depends on the heart's desire. It depends on what we want in the heart. It doesn't depend on one specific religious affiliation. It depends on one's devotional intention. So in that sense, the Bhagavad Gita is universal in saying that access to God depends on, on the intention of the heart, not the affiliation of the body or of the uh, of affiliation based on race or religion or whatever else. Now, what does the second half mean? Mama Vartman Vartante Manushyaha Partha Sarvashaha as I said, some people, uh, some Gita commentators translate this as, all paths lead to me. Now, while this, if it's taken literally, it has several logical problems. Prabhupada asked a simple question when he was presented this translation. He says that, if all paths lead to God, then why does have to God, God have to speak anything? If whatever Arjuna will do, he will ultimately attain Krishna, then why does Krishna have to speak the Gita? There are many places when, where in the Gita Krishna says that there are di very divergent, even opposite trajectories that our life will take depending on the choices we make. Conclusively, mm, is conclusively the if if in the Bhagavad Gita 1858 he says Mat Chitta if you become conscious of me, you will pass over all obstacles by my grace. I says, if however, if you don't become conscious of me, you will be lost. So when Krishna says this, what does it mean? 
it means it's giving clearly choices and choices have consequences so it's not giving a feel good kind of spirituality that says whatever you do you will attain me so what does this mean mama vartmanu vartante manushya paatha sarvasha so all paths lead to me is not ex- is, is not krishna's message actually now there are definitely the bhagavata talks about different paths and these different paths will ultimately lead to him so the karma through karma yoga through gyan yoga through bhakti yoga through all of these ultimately people can attain krishna but that is that various paths can take us to god is very different from saying that all paths lead to god then what is, so so saying that this this trans this verse says all paths lead to me is is an over simplification to the point of distortion but then what does this verse mean mama vartmanu vartante anushya partha sarvashaha so the sarvashaha adjective is closer to manushya than pa- vartma vartma is path manushya is people so sarvashya is all so rather than all paths lead to me sir the adjective is much closer to manush to manushya than vartma so we could say that all paths uh, rather than saying all paths lead to me it is all people are on my path mama vartma the students are right next to each other that's in my path now again what does this mean all people are on my path so this leads to a deeper principle that we will explore later but at this point to understand this simply that huh, when i talked about material consciousness and spiritual consciousness i said this is the bottom of the mountain this is the top of the mountain the top of the mountain is not a spiritual consciousness that's true at the same time god is not limited to the top of the mountain god exists everywhere so eta pravrtir bhutanam yena sarvam idam tatam yena sarvam idam tatam by him all of existence is pervaded so in fact everything comes from him and everything is pervaded by him so what that means is if somebody does goes up the top top of the mountain that's good somebody goes around and around the mountain somebody goes away from the mountain into a valley somebody just keep going half the way up the mountain wherever a person is going they are attracted to something that they are attracted to something and that's how they are going in that direction and later on the principle krishna will tell in 1041 in the bhagavad gita that yadyad vibhuti matsatvam shri madurjitam eva va tatta deva avagachhatvam mama tejo amsha sambhava but everything attractive manifests a spark of krishna splendor so what this means is if everything attractive manifests a spark of krishna splendor that means that whatever anyone is attracted to they are attracted to krishna shri prabhupad would say that if a person is alcoholic and they can't give up alcohol if while craving for alcohol while drinking alcohol with they think that this is the taste of krishna then by remembering krishna in this way one day they will become devotees of krishna now he is not saying by drinking alcohol they will become devotees of krishna but by seeing the connection between the attractive power of alcohol and the supreme attractiveness of krishna by remembering krishna thus they will that will begin their spiritual journey and eventually they will attain krishna so when krishna says all people are on my path what it means is that whatever anyone is attracted to they are attracted to krishna however they are not conscious that they are attracted to krishna and that's why when they go on that path they don't go to krishna so everything attractive comes from krishna but everything attractive doesn't take us to krishna i'll repeat this everything attractive comes from krishna but everything attractive doesn't take us to krishna what this means is now let's change the metaphor a little bit instead of the top of a mountain the top the, the example of a bottom and top of a mountain gives us a sense of the trajectory that needs to be followed and certainly it is our consciousness that needs to be transformed and it, it is at a particular level now particular place particular level it's material level and that consciousness has to go to the spiritual level 
but it is not that god is present only at the spiritual level as i said god is present everywhere in his various manifestations so let's change the metaphor to that of an ocean suppose somebody is in a in a desert lost and there is a there is a ocean at some distance from them not yet visible for them now from that ocean some drops of water might be might have just trick just blown by the wind or whatever and they have fallen or some drops might be fallen along the way that goes toward the ocean some drops might be just on the left side right side where they don't uh, where person that those drops are more at the same distance from the ocean and some drops may on the maybe on the opposite side of the ocean so now all these drops have come from the ocean but all those drops but going toward those drops won't necessarily take the person toward the ocean so similarly everything if you consider krishna to be the ocean and the various attractive things in this world to uh, the attract to the drops then everything attractive comes from krishna but everything attractive doesn't take us to krishna so so in that sense mama vartman vartante manushya parth sarvashah all people are on my path that means they are ultimately pursuing me no matter whatever they are pursuing that doesn't necessarily mean that just by pursuing those thing an alcoholic by drinking alcohol uh a uh, manic sports fan that just by binging on sports matches is not going to attain krishna but if they contemplate philosophically okay what is it about this that captivates me so much oh there is this player who bats so say this cricket match is there player who bats so well okay but where does this player's ability come from that ability comes from krishna where does the thrill that comes in a sports match when there's a tense final this tense concluding phase of the match and some exciting finish happens but all that excitement is actually a drop of the excitement that is experienced in the spiritual level of reality when a soul has a relationship with krishna the soul is about to meet krishna and doesn't know whether i'll meet or not so that is all so that is all the idea that we all surrender to krishna and that we all that krishna is everywhere and at the same time going everywhere won't take us to krishna because it is our consciousness that has to rise toward krishna so everything attractive comes from krishna but everything attractive doesn't take us to krishna now having understood this this point that we have that mama vartman vartante manushya partha sarvasha so now this is there is i talked about exclusivism pluralism and inclusivism now there is a beautiful example of inclusivism in a quote of bhaktivinod thakur so bhaktivinod thakur states that <clears throat> if we go to the place of worship of some other tradition where god is worshiped in a in a way different from ours then what should we do so he says we should be this be there in a respectful worshipful mood and we appreciate that we have appreciate that god has extended himself out of his loving compassion for these people and manifested in a way that they can appreciate that they can connect that they can devote themselves to so our appreciation for god's compassion can increase how compassionate is my lord that he manifests in this way for these people and at the same time this is our devotion to the lord in the form that we are attracted to that we can connect with that becomes deeper so this is what we talk about that you know we can commit to our path at the same time we can appreciate other paths so how does this work it's like if we are trying to go up a mountain and we have come to a particular height and somebody else has gone up the mountain they have come to a particular height and now they share notes they might be at different places they not exactly at the next to each other but maybe they are both at the same level in their respective journeys and if they share their notes there are something similar there are something very different and if there is a sincere there is a sincere desire to learn and share 
then both can enrich their understanding of their path and their purpose. So, Shri Prabhupada would often say in the, when he came to the Western world that I have not come here to make Christians into Hindus. There is a horizontal conversion where people are pull, pulled from going up the mountain by this path, come over here and go up by this path. So Prabhupada is not interested in the horizontal conversion. Horizontal conversion is basically changing people's location from the bottom of the mountain from one place to another place. Vertical conversion, if at all we want to use the terminology conversion, but conversion nowadays have a very negative connotation. But we could say vertical transformation. What that essentially means is that there is a change of people's location, not horizontally from one place to another place, but vertically in terms of their consciousness. The consciousness rises from the material level to the spiritual level. So, so Prabhupada's interest was in vertical transformation, not in horizontal conver conversion. And what does this vertical transformation mean? That means that somebody becomes devoted to the Lord and starts rising toward the Lord. So if somebody was already a committed Christian, Prabhupada would encourage them to follow Christianity with greater commitment, with greater depth. He would encourage them to follow their commandments more clearly. Prabhupada, Prabhupada felt that thou shall not kill is a commandment that Christians are not following properly. And that that can be used to encourage them to become vegetarian. And that would help them to rise to higher consciousness. Now, some people who are nominally Christians, that means they're just born in a particular family, but they had no interest per se in spiritual growth. And they had no, they did not see that their particular religious uh, affiliation by birth as a path to spiritual growth. Then Prabhupada wouldn't bother too much about it. And he would say that you can, you can practice the path given by Krishna and Lord Chaitanya. So, and he would inspire them to take up, take up that path. So now, <clears throat> Prabhupada was both, we could say, inclusivist. So there is a universal aspect to spirituality and there is a confidential aspect to spirituality. So the universal aspect is that, there is a un that we all want to go up the mountain. And everybody should be encouraged to go up the mountain. At the same time, the confidential aspect means that there are certain things which are revealed in certain traditions alone. So just like if we are at the bottom of a mountain, sometimes if you go to look to the top, sometimes the paths might be paths might be shrouded with trees or cliffs and we might not be able to see the peak very clearly and some parts might be so clear that even from the bottom we can see the peak much more clearly so like that in the bhakti yoga tradition our understanding is that we have a very clear glimpse a clear vision of god A clear vision of God should be there. And that vision is what uh, we are sharing. So Prabhupada would say that there is, there is a description of Krishna's pastimes of that one absolute truth. Ekam sat vipra vadanti. The Upanishads say that there is one truth. But the wise people know that truth by different names. So Prabhupada would say Krishna, Christ, Buddha, Allah. Yahweh, these are all names of that one absolute truth. So one absolute truth can have different names. And we say that in, in our tradition, there is a distinctive revelation of God that is not there in other traditions. Now, this is not just a sectarian claim for one-upsmanship that my tradition is better than yours. God is not the monopoly of any tradition. God is, in fact, all traditions are devoted to God. God is not, God is not limited to any tradition. And God is bigger than any of the paths and religions and processes that we may devote to him. So God transcends every conceptual framework 
that we might use to approach him or to understand him. But the, uh, so having said that, this is not a sectarian claim to one of manship. This is just an objective statement based on the study of their texts. If you look at the Old Testament, the New Testament, if you look at the Quran, there is not much positive description of God. In the Old Testament is basically a description of uh, the adventures of God's chosen people. The adventures and the misadventures, we could say. Uh, so how there were slaves in Egypt and how Moses helped them to come to the promised land and subsequently what all happened. That's what is described in those books. And it's and basically God comes mostly as a supernatural presence who intervenes sometimes to protect those who are devoted to him and sometimes to punish those who go against him or even punish his own people when they choose to go away from him. But God per se is not directly revealed. Even in the New Testament, or the Christian Bible, the Old Testament is sometimes called the Hebrew Bible. So now, in the New Testament, there is again, it's most of it is, large is, actually Paul's epistles, Paul's letters that he wrote. Paul was a, uh, one of the followers of Jesus who actually never met Jesus. In fact, while Jesus was alive, Paul actively persecuted Christians on behalf of the Roman Emperor. But then he had a, he went blind once on the road to Damascus and then he had a transformative experience. Jesus restored his eyes to him and then he became devoted to Jesus. So most of what we call as a Bible is actually Paul's instructions about how to live, uh, live morally and how to follow Jesus. And now, so that doesn't have any, that's more moral instructions rather than any, any spiritual revelations. And even Jesus, the, the most important part of the Bible, we could say is the Gospels. The four Gospels are written by four different apostles. And they uh, are basically description of Jesus' activities while he was there from different perspectives. And Jesus, during his life, he mostly taught through parables, so stories with, with some moral import to them. And none of those stories have any deep personal revelations about God, about God's nature or God's personality. So, <clears throat> so if we consider the Quran, the Quran is spoken basically till the age of 40, Muhammad had a fairly normal life. And then, although he was known to have times of solitary contemplation, at one particular point, uh, after a hard life, when he had settled down and he, he had become relatively influential <clears throat> after marrying the widow who had been his employer, he at that time once went into a cave and he heard a voice. He says, write. He says, I can't write. He says, no, write. And then he understood that the Archangel Gabriel speaking to him. And then Muhammad heard those words. And later on, he spoke those words to others. Sometimes he'll be just talking with people and he would suddenly feel, oh, uh, the divine is speaking through me. And then write it down. So he, he spoke these revelations at different times. And several decades after his, after he, after his demise, then the, his followers compiled together that into a Quran. So it is, so the Quran is basically mostly a unidirectional, unidirectional revelation where there is no serious philosophical discussion or any deep personal revelation of God's nature. So again, none of this, what I said is to minimize the, the potency of these traditions or to say that those who have followed these traditions have not risen to high spiritual levels. All that I'm saying is that if we look from the bottom of the mountain, from some sides, some paths, we can see the peak more clearly. From other sides, the path might still be taking us to the peak, but the peak can't be seen so clearly because there are, because of various reasons. The path might be going round and round. There might be wild, there might be uh, trees and cliffs. So 
So as paths for growing spiritually, there have been exalted saints in many, many traditions across the world. Saints who have been completely devoted to, the, to God. But as, as revelation, so, so in that sense, there's a universal aspect of the revelation that ultimately God wants to, wants the soul to reach him. And thus there are different paths for reaching him. At the same time, you know, we can appreciate the path that we have. Now, and we appreciate that in terms of the certain specific attributes. So one attribute I'm talking about here is that the revelation of God's personal identity is much more in the bhakti tradition. Where, uh, so now that's how we can appreciate our path and commit to our path, but also appreciating others and their commitment to their paths. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur says that by seeing others' devotion to their paths, our devotion to our path should increase. That's so when we say Muslims doing their namaz regularly, then we, you know, I should also do my prayers regularly. So they are approached. So Prabhupada was in Iran, and at that time, he was talking with some devotees after they had invited some guests, and those guests had left. And suddenly, the namaz prayer started in the background. And Prabhupada folded his hands and closed his eyes and was silent and prayerful for the whole, the complete prayers. And then after that, Prabhupada opened his eyes and his eyes were bright. And he said, wasn't that beautiful? And some of the devotees were a little taken aback. And they said, Prabhupada, but wouldn't it be better if they were chanting Hare Krishna? And Prabhupada looked almost pained. He said, why are you making me sectarian? So they are worshipping God in their way. We are worshipping God in our way. So Prabhupada was broad enough to appreciate that God can be accessed through different paths. And Prabhupada in this way demonstrated what Bhakti Vinod Thakur is saying that we should be respectful and prayerful when God we encounter God in some way different from what we are normally familiar with. So now, what if we are going to follow a particular path? Basically, how do we know that a path is taking us up the mountain? So we so we talk about inclusivism, and you understand one purpose, many paths. But we also differentiate inclusivism from pluralism. So how do we know that that one path is taking us up, or whether that path is taking us up or round and round, or whether it is taking us uh, away from the mountain into a valley? So basically, two things. If the path is taking us up the mountain, one thing that should happen is that the peak should come closer. Uh, and the ground should become grow further from us, go further from us. So that means that as we go toward the spiritual level of reality, if, if you are following a path that is taking us towards the spiritual level of reality, then the attractiveness of the spiritual will be revealed more and more to us. And thus, we should feel, we should we start feeling more serenity, more purity, more ecstasy in our connection with the divine, in our absor absorption of the divine. And as we rise up the mountain, we go further and further away from the bottom of the mountain. So the bottom, if the bottom of the mountain is material consciousness, then as we go closer to the top, our attachment to worldly things should start decreasing. So basically, attachment to the divine and detachment from worldly infatuations. That these two are broad characteristics of, of a path that is actually taking us on a spiritual journey. Now the specifics of the spiritual attachment and the specifics of the material attachment, they may vary in different paths. The, deg the degrees to which the detachment from matter is stressed may vary. And individual practitioners may themselves exhibit different degrees of detachment. But the principle is that these two things, if they are happening, then the path is path is taking us up the mountain. So if we consider this attach, attachment to this divine and attachment from matter, that way we can, we can evaluate a path, evaluate not in a judgmental sense, but in a sense of understanding our purpose and see whether a path is taking us toward that purpose or not. 
So in this way, we can have an inclusive vision of reality wherein we both appreciate, appreciate our path and commit to it while also appreciate path, other paths and appreciate people's commitments to those paths. So <clears throat> I'll summarize what I spoke and then we can have a few questions. I started by speaking about how we discussed 411 Kith and the principle of reciprocity. So why are there different paths? I talked about the basic metaphor was going to the top of the mountain, bottom of the mountain. The top of the mountain is spiritual level of consciousness, bottom is material level. So various spiritual paths can be categorized into three broad levels, exclusivism, pluralism, and inclusivism. So exclusivism claims that, that one path has exclusive rights to God, and that is narrow-minded. And it is it also it is it is fanatical and it it makes an unlimited God seem seem parochial and limited. Then we can go to the other extreme of the. So if you have pendulum, one side of the pendulum is exclusivism, the other side of the pendulum is inclusivism, where all paths are right. That is not right because all paths don't take us to the top of the mountain. Secondly, then we talk about all paths also in terms of. Uh, it's also if all paths are right, then one path is the logical issue is there that one path is also the path of uh, one one path says that my path only is right, so that is its logical contradiction. Then I talk about Bhakti and Thakur's appreciation of how we appreciate our devotion to God increases when we see Him in a manifestation different from ours, and how our devotion to our path increases by seeing others' devotion to their paths. Uh, and then we talk about how there's a universal dimension to spirituality and there's a confidential dimension for each tradition. So the confidential dimension is that we can say that the top, the top is viewed differently from different traditions. And I talked about how the specific revelation of God's personality and beauty is not that much there in some traditions. And it is much more in some traditions. So we, now we also talked about how what is the meaning of Mamu Vartmanu Vartante Manushya Partha Sarvasha? It all paths lead to me would make Krishna speaking the Bhagavad Gita itself redundant because Krishna talks about doing certain things and not doing certain things. And then when, when it says all, all people are on my path, that means that Krishna is like the ocean from where broader droplets have, have flown over to various sides. And some drops take people toward the ocean, some away from the ocean. So everything attractive comes from Krishna, but everything attractive doesn't take us to Krishna. So whatever a person is pursuing, they're actually pursuing Krishna. To the extent they realize that they're pursuing Krishna, to that extent, they will redirect their request toward Krishna. And ultimately, they will attain Krishna. So, <clears throat> so, this is, so now there are a few questions. Let's take them one by one. So is uh, the idea that there is that is belonging to a parampara a sign of uh, uh, religious affi affiliation or what is it? Well, not exactly. You have to understand that there are multiple aspects to what is being done. that God is not limited by any material designation. <clears throat> is affiliation to parampara a prerequisite to distinguishing a valid path from a fake one? Not necessarily, because first of all, the four paramparas are what we know as revealed in one particular text that we have. Are those the only four paramparas? We, in our own tradition, we have had saints who have been accepted as saints who did not belong to the paramparas. Miravai is an example. And, uh, in the, and there are many other saints. So the, the, the idea of a parampara should not be used to make an inclusive tradition into an exclusive tradition. What the parampara essentially, now it could we understand that the soul goes on a multi-life journey. And the soul is on a multi-life journey. That means that 
some people might have been on a spiritual path, spiritual journey in a previous life. And they already were affiliated with a spiritual master. They already evolved spiritually. And in this life, they may not be connected with a spiritual master or a tradition right now. now of course, we shouldn't claim that we are in that category. That would be presumptuous for us. But we have to respect devotion wherever it manifests. One of the characteristics of devotion that is described in our tradition is that it is not dependent on anything else. So it is not dependent on uh, the affiliation to parampara. At the time of death, Krishna is not going to check our attendance at a particular fire sacrifice ritual. And then the entry to the spiritual world is not going to be barred, just uh, not just be going to be given to everyone who is marked present and barred to everyone who is marked absent. It is based ultimately on the affiliation of the heart. There are people who took initiation from Prabhupada and they never disappeared after that. Prabhupada said, I never initiated them because initiation is a matter of the heart. So um, we understand that there can be the principle of traditions can be many. And the idea is that we need to be connected with God and be progressing on the path toward God. So <clears throat> generally speaking, uh, the principle of parampara is Krishna says, Evam parampara praptam imam raja risha yoviduhu. He says that in this way, this knowledge was transmitted. So that is, that is a description. It is, it is not necessarily a, a exclusive prescription. Krishna is not saying that this is the only way I will ever for the rest of eternity reveal myself. So we can say that if we are in the parampara, it is a safe way of getting knowledge. It's just like if we go to an authorized doctor, then getting treatment, there is a there is a reasonable chance that the treatment that we get will be good. But if there are certain certain ailments, even a grandmother in a home might know certain cures for this, for certain home remedies, and they do work. Now the grandmother is not going to replace a doctor entirely, and the government is not grandmother may not start a start a start a medical doctor's training academy. So in that sense, there is a difference. But but the principle here is that there is not uh, that wherever if some cure is happening, then that is good. So we accept that. So if somebody is attached to the Lord and somebody is express exhibiting detachment from matter, then we appreciate the devotion that is present over there. We don't necessarily become exclusive with saying that this is not in the parampara, so this is not to be accepted. Prabhupada was asked explicitly, there's a Les Cranes TV show and there was a Christian and Prabhupada were both together. The, the, the TV host asked Prabhupada, asked the Christian monk, Christian priest, Christian teacher, that, you know, so this is the whole, is your holy book, this is the Bible. And he asked, what is your holy book? So this is Bhagavad Gita. So he said that, do you follow, if somebody follows this, this, this book, the Gita, will people go back to God? And the, the, the Christian priest said, the path to God is narrow and difficult. So then he turned to Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada and he asked, if somebody follows the Bible, will they go back to God? Prabhupada says, if anybody follows the message of God, they will go attain God. So Prabhupada was quite clear about that. Now, <clears throat> regarding how will we know if you're on the right path? Well, basically, I said uh, Chan, that there is increased attachment to spirit. That means we. That we are basically growing spiritually and becoming attached to spirit and becoming detached from matter. That's what is. Well, the question about different degrees of surrender, I'll talk about that when we talk about surrender in future.
So, you know, the whole concept of devtas, I'll talk about that in the future class. I don't want to go into that right now. So, now chanting is the only way. How do you understand that it is inclusivism? <clears throat> Well, what is chanting? It is Harer Nama, Harer Nama. Now Prabhupada said that any name of God if we chant, people can be elevated. So there is a universal aspect and there's a confidential aspect. The universal aspect, Bhaktivana Thakur talks about this, that but there are names of God which refer to his relationship with the world. And there are names of God which refer to his his uh, Self-existential glory. That means that there are names of God that refer to how He is the provider, how He is the protector, how He is the maintainer, how He is the source of the world. And He says those names, they are also talking about God's glory. But they are more about what God is doing for us, not who God is in His own right. So Bhakti Thakur says that the names of God, which directly refer to him in his self-existential glory, they highlight his personality more and thus they remind us of God more in his own self-existence. So in that sense, the spiritual attraction toward the Lord is awakened more, awakened more by remembering those names. So, but any names of God can elevate us. And so chanting, we shouldn't just see that as simply chanting one particular mantra alone. Then we, then that, uh, then we see that that chanting is a principle of inclusivism. And again, <coughs> there are different names in different traditions. And if people chant the names of God according to their tradition, it also will elevate them. Ultimately, what is chanting? It is not just a string of a mantra. It is an expression of love. It's an expression of devotion. When we love someone, we naturally get great joy in remembering them, in uh, calling out their names. So take that process in inverse, that by calling out their names or calling out the names of our Lord, our devotion for Him will increase. And that's how we move forward in our lives. So that's the principle of of devotion, of inclusivism with respect to chanting. Now, how can we be efficient in executing our bottom duties while we are trying to go to the top of the mountain? Or we are in between? Well, it is not that we give up those duties, but rather we start seeing those duties with a great more spiritual understanding. Instead of just working to think that I am, I want to become wealthy, I want to become famous. We don't, we see that the abilities that we have are gifts from God and we use those abilities to, to, to make a contribution on his behalf. I earlier talked in the previous session about how happiness comes not by collecting and consuming, but by connecting and contributing. So we see our abilities as gifts by which we can connect with the Lord in our heart through our feelings of gratitude that he has given us those abilities. And when we use, when we do our duties and we make a contribution to others by our, by our dutifulness, that contribution is, uh, we see that we are doing this part on behalf of God so that they can move forward in their spiritual journey. So it's not that the bottom duties are to be rejected. So the bottom is not, a, it's a level of consciousness. So <clears throat> if we have a deeper level of consciousness, then we can actually do those duties with a deeper level, deeper understanding, a deeper commitment. It's like a teacher might teach just because I have to earn, I have to earn a living. A teacher might teach because I want to shape the future of humanity, right? training those who are going to become the future leaders of humanity. So the second vision will be much more inspiring. So if we see that our work, we are 
So Karmanath Mabhyavcha, by your work, worship him. How work can we worship? We'll discuss when we come to that in the 18th chapter. But essentially, we understand that our abilities and our resources, we use them to make a connection and a contribution. Then connection with the Lord inside and contribution on his behalf outside. Then we can all do our duties responsibly. And also we do our devotional duties, our practice, our devotional practice, so that we connect him with, with him better. And So among the three divisions of knowledge, Shruti, Shruti and Nyaya Prasthan, the first Shruti is plural, the Nyaya is exclusive and Shruti is inclusive. This is an interesting way of looking at things. I'd say that We we'll need a little bit more discussion on this, but let me put it to three points in this connection. First, I'll explain what Shruti, Smriti, and Nyaya are. So, Shruti basically refers to the primarily the Vedas and the Upanishads, which are revelations, which are said to be revelations, which the sages heard directly from the Lord. And then Smriti is, revel is recollections, or what someone call this tradition, that is, what the sages had heard, they transmitted to others, and when this was repeated over generations, then that became a revelation. So the Smriti in Shruti, the letters themselves are important because they are considered to be directly the revelation to the divine. In Smriti, so the Bhagavatam was four verses, the Shloki Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam expanded to thousands and thousands of verses. So that's Smriti. And then there is Nyaya. So Nyaya refers primarily to the Vedanta Sutra. So where it's primarily using logic that the inferences are given that uh, say what certain sections of Upanishads are saying, it's a little complicated to understand. So how exactly do they point to an ultimate reality? That is what is talked about in these traditions, in, in the Nyaya literature primarily. It's Vedanta Sutra. So these are called the three, three. So how do we know what is the essential message of the Vedic literature? Within the tradition, this Prasthanatraya, this three fundamental sources of knowledge are referred to. And traditionally, any Acharya or any tradition itself, which wanted to establish itself authentic, then it would have to, uh, it would have to comment on these three, three fundamental books. So Shruti, Smriti, and Nyaya. Now, in our context, if we consider that the <clears throat> Shruti itself is primarily, especially as it is widely known, it talks about various worships of the Devtas. And this worship of the Devtas is, is in some ways plural, that you, know, you can worship this God or you can worship that God. So in that sense, it is, it can be said to be pluralistic. Of course, the Vedic conception of divinity is very, very subtle and nuanced. It goes beyond it goes beyond the ideas of the simply monotheism and polytheism. It is a sophisticated form of a divinity which is called of theology which is called as it can be called as polymorphic monotheism. I'll talk about that later. But yes, at first glance we can say that the Shruti, especially the Karmakanda kind of it, can appear to be pluralism. Now, as far as the Nyaya is concerned, it focuses on, on oneness primarily. Although, what is the nature of that oneness? That's a matter of discussion. So, it does include. So, Nyaya focuses more on monism, which could be seen as in some ways inclusivism, some ways as pluralism also because in that the idea is there are various gods but ultimately there's, there's one ultimate reality. Now in the Smriti specifically, the Bhagavatam definitely it integrates the various conceptions of divinity and gives us a understand, an inclusive understanding of the divine. 
where God is not just impersonal or personal. God is both personal and impersonal, where there, there are the devutas and there is the supreme being and there is a hierarchy among them, but there is also connectedness among them. So the Srutis are definitely inclusivist. So now, last question I'll take. From, so following rules and regulations of sadhana strictly and instructing others to follow the same. Does this mean someone is forcing them to follow a specific path? How is this con different from spreading, spreading a particular path? Well, there's nothing wrong in inviting people uh, to rise up the mountain by the path that we are following. So when we find a particular path transformational, we naturally feel inspired and we want to share that the, the process of transformation with others. So it is, uh, is it conversion? Is it that people are being forced to do this? Well, everybody has free will. And nobody is pointing a gun at anyone else and saying that if you don't follow this, you will be killed. So there's definitely no force. Is there intellectual force or emotional force? Well, that depends on the individual practitioners. There is often when people are new, there is the zeal of the new convert where somebody thinks that I know the truth and you are you are you are wrong and I will prove to you the truth. And that there, there some people can present Krishna. Krishna conscious in that way. But we, I look at it, I showed how Prabhupada and Bhaktivinoda Thakur presented things. So, yes, there is a particular path and somebody commits to the particular path, then they can rise up the mountain. And certainly, every path will, will encourage people to come up the path by that way. Because we have found this path beneficial and transformation. But does that mean that we condemn other paths and reject other paths? No. It is a way to keep and everybody can, it is a way to rise to higher consciousness. And whoever can rise to higher consciousness in whatever way, that is their inspiration to follow. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hare Krishna.